Hello, I'm Chris Naretko, and welcome to a new episode of Skaters in Cars. Looking at spots. Today we're gonna meet up with the world's most famous skateboarder, Tony Hawk, cruise around North County, San Diego, and check out some spots. Hey, what's up? Hi, Tony. How are you? Sorry, I'm late. That's okay. I have kids. I live here. I have kids too. But you know, I, I don't want to wait, make people waiting. Sorry, you're a big celebrity and all. I got nervous. <laughs> Can I get a nickel tour or are we taking the yeah. car? Uh, whatever you want. It's your show. I would like a nickel tour. I've never been to the birdhouse. All right. Is that what we call it? Or the bird's nest? Uh, well, it's officially called THI. Tony Hawk Institute. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Oh, damn. This ramp come with this place? <laughs> no, I actually had the ceiling raised um, for this ramp. Did you seriously raise it? Yeah, uh, we raised it to the limit of not having to sub resubmit plans. You ever get bored of it? No, I love it. I love that it's finally like, I get spoiled, but the ramp is so perfect that all you have to do is focus on tricks. Do you know what I mean? Like every other terrain that we've ever skated through the years, it's always like you're adjusting because of the imperfections, which is awesome. Yeah. But at some point, like I just wanted an even playing field so that I could really explore what's possible. The only drawback to that is that when I go other places, everything feels terrible because yeah. I take this for granted. That makes sense. Are you still coming up with new tricks or is it just playing free bird? <laughs> no, it, no, it's like, it's new tricks, but it's just kind of my own. It's more like low impact, technical stuff that I'm interested in and maybe doesn't resonate across the industry, but I don't really care because it's like my way of being creative and it's what I enjoy doing. And, you know, there's tricks that I've been shooting recently, like I'm only gonna make one, yeah. that's it, I'm done with it. But I was stoked because it was like my own challenge and figured it out. You ever throw on the old Powell Pearl to videos and just start crying? <laughs> no, I start crying at, at maybe it's at some of the fashion sense, yeah. Oh yeah, I would, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> You want to go to my old house where the Fallbrook ramp was? That sounds good. I don't know who lives there, and I don't know if they'll be friendly, but we can find out. That sounds like a good time. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to go to Fallbrook. I lived there for about five years in my life, and it's where I had my own half pipe that was in the PAL videos. You know, it was fun while it lasted, but that was pretty much the end of those years was like, when everything took a dive. I just couldn't afford to live there anymore. There was a point in the 80s where you, you and the guys on the Bones Brigade were printing your own money. Oh yeah, for sure. I'd say 88, 89, we thought we were invincible. You know, the money was just coming and, and like they couldn't make enough boards. Ballpark number a month, I've heard, you know, upwards of like 20 or 30 grand a month. Yeah, I think 20 was the high end. Yeah. It fluctuated from 10 to 20 every month, pretty much. And then when it started going down, it went down in flames. My checks were cut in half every month in like 90, 91. Wow. I mean, what was me, but beyond that, sponsors were cutting my salary in half every month too. So Tracker, Airwalk, everything was just like, they'd call me and they'd say, oh, sorry, we gotta, you know, we gotta cut your check. And then two months later, oh yeah, we're gonna have to cut it in half again. I know Rob Deerdick remembers he got one Christmas a $7 check from Alien Workshop. He still has it and has it framed. Do you remember your worst check? Uh, I got a check for 85 cents. Really? Yeah, but that was like when my board first got released. So that was what 1982. Was that? There was no expectation. So it was just kind of like, oh, I got money for skateboarding. You know what I mean? It was, <laughs> it's funny, but it was like, there was no guarantee of anything then. What was it like once you break out of this 85 cent check stage to 10 to 20,000 a month. And then the 90s come along and you know the rug gets pulled out from underneath you. What it's was that It's a panic. Like? I mean, I, I felt it the latest for sure, but it was a panic mostly because I had set myself up to be living in that income. And so I had this big house, you know, we were just starting a family. Riley was almost born. And it was like, holy shit, my livelihood is gone. It's gone. I decided to start a company because I wanted to stay in the skate industry. I believed in skateboarding. I loved it. I, it's what I knew for sure. And I felt like it would take the least amount of capital to start a company at a time when the industry was at its deadest state. Because to be recognized in the skate industry it didn't take a whole lot of money. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? You just had to have a reputation, have some good riders, and you'd make a splash because all the companies were going under. So that's what Pear Wheelander and I did with, with our savings. We both pooled our money together, started a distribution company, started Birdhouse, helped to start uh, Real and Firm, and uh, we took a chance. And it was rough. It was a rough living for probably the first four or five years of Birdhouse. I took a second mortgage out of my house that I was living in, eventually just sold it for what I owed on it, moved into a smaller place and ate Taco Bell and Top Ramen for a good three years. <laughs> oh, weird. I haven't been here in over 20 years. Where was the ramp at? Uh, the ramp, well, the vert ramp was up this hill. The mini ramp was between the garage and the house. And then we had a bunch of quarter pipes here. I wonder what the people are like to live here now. I wonder if they skate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Ring the doorbell, I guess. Hello. Hi, how are you? We're just wondering if we could borrow a cup of sugar. Is Splenda okay? We don't have it. Oh, sure. No, actually, I'm Tony. I used to live here. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Hi, how are you? My name is Sean. Hi. Hey, Tony. Come on in. Oh, thank you. Wow. I haven't been here over there 20 is. years. It's nicer than when I lived here. I lived here with a bunch of roommates that were all in their teens. I've actually seen a YouTube video with you skating. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we had a mini ramp right between here and the garage. Yeah. You knew Tony Hawk lived at your house? Yeah, it was advertised in the uh, in the listing. Really? Former <laughs> home of Tony Hawk. That was, oh, seriously, so, that was a selling point? I don't well, think that'd be a selling point. point. <laughs> yeah. But it was mentioned. I think it's more of an FYI. Wow, so when, when I lived here, it was all dirt with dog poop everywhere. And there was trampoline there. And then we would just go to the pool and the trampoline. And I ignored all the dog poop. <laughs> I remember these neighbors hated me over here. Cause, I heard that. Yeah, well, because we had the ramp and we were skating and that's all they ever heard. The catalyst was when we shot Ban This because Stacy lit up the hillside. And so it looked like a UFO landed over there. And we were skating until, I don't know, you know, 9 or 10 p.m. And that, that was it. That's when they pretty much took legal action. Oh my God, we should go visit them. No. Come on, let's no. go see them. <laughs> so people complain about Niger, but you were way worse. We were just skating though, it wasn't like we were, we are not having keggers or anything. No one wanted to come out here to party, it was too far away. <laughs> this dog yard, that's where the mini ramp was, literally backed up to that door and to that door. I don't know, it was in Ban This and maybe Public Domain? What was the setup, what was the configuration of that ramp? It was a mini ramp with a spine, the spine came back here and then the main part of the mini ramp bowled in because we had to build a fence. The city came, we were building it and they were like, you can't build a structure like this without permits and they couldn't figure out what it was or how to go about it. And they said, well, as long as you attach it to a fence, then we will let it go. So my dad built a fence pretty much where this fence is. And then we backed up the mini ramp into it. So we kind of forced a bowl at the end. And then the vert ramp was right up the hill. And that was your old man that My stopped, dad, right? yeah. So the, the ramp that we did up here, we built a bowl. That was, as far as I know, one of the first wooden corners ever made. Oh, really? Yeah, my dad engineered the whole thing. He figured out the radius is going up. and how he would bend the wood and everything. And that was his mission. When I would come up with an idea, he would start figuring it out on paper. You know, we did all the grunt work and he was figuring out like a scientist how to make corners. So the ramp was here. And what was um, that set up? It's all overgrown, but the main half pipe was here. And then we set up pillars to, um, to make it all flat and even. So the main part of the ramp was here. And then this went up a shelf and then the mini ramp was up back here. You remember uh, dimensions on the ramp? Uh, let's see, the ramp was, I think it was 40 feet wide, 12 feet tall, and then the bowl was originally seven feet deep with eight foot trannies, and then we changed it to uh, five feet deep with seven foot trannies and made it bigger. By 90, by the end of 1990, I couldn't afford to, to take care of it anymore. So the ramp just sat here, then that was it. Did you burn it to the ground before you moved? Uh, no, that was the worst part of the demise of this place for me, was having to tear down the ramp. There's there's no payoff, you know what I mean? You're yeah. dismantling this structure for what? <laughs> Just to clear it out, to sell the place? Yeah, it's a heartbreaker. What's it feel like to be back here? Um, it's nice, actually. These were formative years. I, I loved it here. It was sad leaving, but I'm glad of where it led me. And you know, I needed that time. I needed that difficult time to really appreciate everything else. You wanna go buy it back? No, I'm good. <laughs> I lived here for about six months when he was born. Then we moved out. So you made Riley in his house? Most likely. Should we go tell them that? Yeah. <laughs>
go talk to the other neighbors. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Nice house, though, for a 20-some-year-old. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was, the property was the thing, you know. That's why, I, that's why I lived out here in the boonies. I think the irony was that near the end, we would just end up skating this quarter pipe in the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> Way over those hills is the valley for Tijuana, and that's where we rented the bull ring for the end. That's where you did the loop. That's where I did the loop, yeah. You are doing well for yourself. How has your perspective changed? Well, I, to, to have lived through that downturn and that dose of reality of, of, you know, you can't take it this for granted ever, and that if you truly love it, you're gonna do it even when you're not getting paid for it. You know, that, that taught me so much, and now everything is gravy, honestly. Like, I can't believe the opportunities I can't, but at my core, I just wanna go skate. It's more ironic that with that success, it helps your skating because you're not worried about paying your rent on top of everything else, you know? You actually get to just skate for a living.